The former president pleading not guilty today at his historic third arraignment now on charges of trying to use his authority to stay in power. The question is, will the new charges actually change his primary opponents and the way they handle Trump on the trail? Joining me now, Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. Thank you for joining us this evening. Vivek, I will say, today you did announce a, um, at, a, at a campaign event that you would not actually say that Biden was legitimately elected. And I, I wonder why it is you are reluctant to acknowledge that. Well, precisely what I said in New Hampshire earlier today is that big tech is actually the one that interfered with the election. There is good evidence. I'm data driven, strong polling data that said that if that Hunter Biden laptop story had been released rather than suppressed on the eve of that election, that likely would have changed the electoral result. That is hard fact in this country. Now from the New York Times to CNN, we'll admit that was true and grounded in fact and a lot of corruption that was laid out, laid to bear then, that was systematically suppressed. And I think that is the single greatest form of election interference risk that we face in this election as well, is technology companies suppressing valid information that the voters need to access to make informed decisions. And I stand by that. Well, Vivek, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'll, of course, leave it to voters to decide what was going to be the reason that they would choose a particular candidate. But because you say you are evidence-driven and you want to uh, make sure that the voters have all the information that they need to make an informed decision about who will represent them, do you agree that it should have an opportunity, these cases against Donald Trump, should have the opportunity to have airing before the actual voters? They have a, a decision as either the jurors or also as voters to know how they should actually select their next president. So I wanna say something very clearly. My self-interest would be to have Donald Trump eliminated from competition. I'm polling a third in the Republican national primary right now. And you know what, if Trump were out of the way, it'd be a lot easier for me. But I don't want to win this election that way. On principle, not on politics, on principle, we should not be a country where the party in power uses police force to indict its political opponents in the midst of an election. And Laura, I have a basic rule of thumb. If you are gonna indict a political opponent in the middle of an election, it better darn well not be based on a novel, untested legal theory. Yet that's exactly the case in each of the three indictments. I think it is no accident that you see three independent indictments on novel legal theories coming down at the exact same time during an election. And I think that this is going to be a grave threat to public trust in the justice system going forward. I'm in this race to unite the country. And I'm sad to say that as our next president, which I expect to be, it's going to make my job that much more difficult to unite this nation when we have set this precedent of the political politicization and weaponization of our justice system. Well, two points. One, there's truly nothing novel about a conspiracy charge against somebody. It's something that's often charged against a variety of defendants and in and out of who have been the former president or just everyday Americans. It's why it's part of the criminal code. But on the second issue of the weaponization, do you have concerns that this talking point that is raised oftentimes about the Biden administration or the Department of Justice being weaponized? I mean, we're talking about 115 or more thousand employees of the Department of Justice, 40 separate departments and 40 separate counterparts, et cetera. You've got divisions like national security and antitrust and tax and civil rights, just to name a few. So to suggest that there is some weaponization, do you think that it would be very difficult if you in fact do get the um, responsibility to lead the executive branch, that you are beginning with the proposition that the entirety of the Department of Justice is weaponized? So I wanna respectfully disagree with the first part of what you said. This is absolutely an unprecedented legal theory. There's a Supreme Court case called Alvarez in 2012 that expressly held that a candidate for political office and a publicly elected official has a First Amendment right to engage in, yes, false speech. That's hard Supreme Court case precedent. Is that good judgment on behalf of that elected official? No, it's not but every bad judgment is not a crime. So this is absolutely unprecedented. It is also unprecedented for the four co-conspirators to be attorneys who are offering legal advice. For an attorney to use a legal theory and be criminalized for it, for giving a client advice, that endangers the legal system as we know it. 
So my view is that many of these bureaucracies, starting with the FBI, have become corrupted at a level that is really incorrigible. That's why I've said as U.S. president, I will shut down the FBI. We'll take the 35,000 employees, 15,000 of them that are agents doing real work on the front lines. We will reorganize them to the U.S. Marshals, to the Drug Enforcement Agency, to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, agencies that have not been politicized. But this is an agency whose history is still dating back to the legacy of J. Edgar Hoover. It is still the J. Edgar Hoover building of the FBI that people are walking into. And the remarkable part of this is just rewind a few decades ago. It was the left, Lauren, that was actually complaining about the politicization and the unfairness of the FBI. Today, it's the right. To me, it's not a partisan issue, left versus right. That bureaucracy is a formula for corruption. And that's why, as our next president, I will shut it down. Well, many people did not have on their bingo card that Republicans would be calling the FBI or the law enforcement entities of our nation in this fashion and disparaging them. But I will, and you will not get argument from me about the legacy of one J. Edgar Hoover, particularly as somebody who prosecuted in the Civil Rights Division. But what you will get some pushback, I think, from a great variety of people is this notion of the unprecedented nature of what we're talking about. And I want to home in yet again on this point. Conspiracy is quite a common charge to have, but also First Amendment and protected speech is something that's Conspiracy so foundational. Conspiracy to commit what, Lauren? Oh, you know better. Well, I, I, I do know better, which is why I stated it quite precisely, that it is, in fact, a commonly actually charged crime. But the actual indictment does outline what the allegations are here. But my point is with respect to the protected speech. Certainly, there are the Supreme Court cases that talk about the fact that protected and political speech is sacrosanct. But, sacrosanct. but the notion here, they allege that it went beyond that in the form of action and conspiring to try to undermine the peaceful transition of power. And for that, I wonder, you've made it very clear that you intend and hope to be able to, if you are the president of the United States, to pardon Donald Trump. Do you think that the American people have a right, however, for the justice process to conclude before you make that statement? So look, my assumption is that the worst statement of the facts for the defendant was exactly what you see in the indictment, in each of these three indictments. That's a reasonable assumption. The prosecution states its harshest case in the indictment. I've read all three, and on all three of the indictments, I believe they are politicized. I believe they leverage novel legal theories. I believe if it had been anybody without the last name of Trump, they would not have brought those indictments under those circumstances. And in the interest of moving this nation forward, and yes, that will be my job as our next president, to unite our country and to move forward towards a national revival, it will absolutely be in the interests of this nation to heal and to move forward by making sure that A, we pardon Trump, and B, we avoid the precedent of this kind of politicization of the justice system. That's the clear right answer. And we can go through each of those indictments from the original one in New York, Alvin Bragg, an individual who actually pledged to run for <clears throat> office on the pledge of investigating this man who brought a first-in-class legal theory to the documents case, which failed to mention the Presidential Records Act, to now this new one, which actually criminalizes the seeking of good faith legal advice, calling that a conspiracy instead, and completely flaunting the precedent in Alvarez. It is not an accident that you see these three cases at the same time. And I'm sorry to say the people who have lost their trust in the justice system have lost that trust for good reason. And it's going to make my job, the next president's job, that much more difficult to rebuild it, which is what also gives me my sense of urgency to speak out, even though it's against my interest, running against Trump in this primary. On the precedent point of it, and again, I, I, I push back quite sternly, of course, on the notion that there is something novel about a case involving um, some of the claims that were made, obviously, in the Mar-a-Lago class classified documents, but we need not quibble about our own interpretation of an indictment. I'll leave that for jurors. But I will ask you, when you're looking at all of this and you are looking at the precedent, do you have some concerns about a precedent that you will not seek to pursue justice if you are a prosecutor 
against somebody simply because they are a candidate for office. Wouldn't that set an awfully dangerous precedent if we were to simply untest that? And I, I note, of course, Jack Smith is somebody who has been prosecuting cases against other elected officials, including some who do not have the last name Trump. I'll mention just a few, John Edwards or Bob Menendez, people in The Hague as well. And we could go on in the public integrity section as well. Do you have concerns that there is going to be a real concern and a loss of faith among the American people with respect to how they perceive our institutions if they do not even endeavor to pursue justice? My view is that nobody is above the law, but nobody is below the law either. And you know what? Even if you just take each of these indictments, there are deeply suspect circumstances, facts, omissions of fact, and both law. And my view is there's a dual standard of justice in the United States now. I've also said as part of my campaign, I have pledged, for example, to also pardon Julian Assange. This is an individual who sits in foreign exile. Even as the person who leaked the documents to Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, had her sentence commuted by President Obama because she's a member of a favored political class. She's transgender. Again, that's two standards of justice based on your political beliefs. Now you have one for Biden, another for Trump. This is not sustainable in our country. I think we have to have one standard of justice for all Americans. I think you and I have a deep disagreement on whether or not this indictment actually sticks to prior legal precedents. I think none of the three do. They're all novel in their own way. And I just think it's a disastrous judgment in setting not a precedent of letting political candidates go. No, as you know, plenty of political candidates who have committed cut and dry fraud claims or otherwise have appropriately been prosecuted, Menendez on down. But the reality is that in this particular case, the fact that this came in the middle of an election, the timing of this, all the cases coming at the exact same time, let's call a spade a spade. This is to stop one man from successfully holding office. That's not the way we want to do things in the United States of America. The voters should consider this information when making their judgment of how they vote, but not using the police state to eliminate competition from running. That is an awful precedent in this country. And I am worried that if we fail to acknowledge that, you know, what we saw even in, on dark days like January 1st, 2021, January 6th, 2021, I worry that that will be the beginning of our march towards a national divorce. That is not where I want to see us go. I am deeply worried about it. <clears throat> I'm in this race to lead a national revival, but we have mm -hmm. to be able to move on from the past to the future to do it. I understand your position. I think President Obama would deeply disagree with your um, assessment of the reasons why he was motivated to commute the sentence of at least Chelsea Manning. But finally, I guess it's very clear. I don't think either of us will be a part of the jury selection process in any of these three different indictments. And if there is a fourth, somehow I think they're going to pass us over in the voir dire process. But as you say, you are evidence and data driven. So I wonder if the juries will have an opportunity to see that evidence in a trial before they make their decision at the polls. Vivek Ramaswamy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, let's get some uh, reaction from our panel. And Gene Rossi, you're a former federal prosecutor. What do you think? Uh, 